Imagine that one day this week you're watching the news and they show a story of a man from India who claimed to have died and then become alive again. And this guru was traveling throughout small villages, performing what some called miracles. And as he went through, eventually the crowds got larger and larger. He claimed to have been sent from God. However, eventually a group of, of Hindu religious leaders felt that this man was a phony. He was ripping people off, leading people astray, and so they apprehended him. A Hindu court made a ruling, and this false prophet was put to death. But now his followers were claimed that he had risen from the dead. I wonder how many of us, upon hearing that story on the news, would become believers and followers of this guru in India. Probably not many of us. We would naturally be pretty skeptical upon hearing a story like that, and anyone who wasn't skeptical would be considered extremely naive and gullible, which should help us to understand how some people think when they hear the story of Easter, although, and it was 2,000 years ago. I mean, where's the proof? Where's the evidence that something this outrageous, something this impossible could actually happen? Heck, even Jesus' closest and most devoted followers were skeptical when they first heard, hey, Jesus is risen from the dead, and they go, no, no, no way, that's not possible. And of course, most of us are familiar with Thomas, doubting Thomas, he's called, who said, unless I see myself firsthand, tangible proof, no way I'm going to believe that. Well, I'm glad that you're here today because we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about how a skeptic might view Easter. Now, today, all around the world, probably at least 2 billion people are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And they will hear in churches and you know, uh, around, the, around the world, it is the most significant event in human history, the resurrection. So much so that it actually divides human history in half, B.C. and A.D. Every calendar in, the, calendar in the world is based on Jesus being the center dividing line. They will hear now if Christ had just died on the cross and that was the end, he would have been no different than Buddha or Gandhi or Muhammad or any other religious leader. But when God raised him from the dead, it proved beyond any doubt that Jesus was indeed the Lord and Savior of the world. However, not everybody believes that. Some people have doubts. They have questions, sort of like doubting Thomas. They need more than hearsay. They need more than just wishful thinking uh, to be convinced. And I'll bet that some of you are that way. You're kind of skeptical by nature. I tend to be pretty skeptical. For instance, I have serious doubts when I hear politicians making campaign promises. It's like, nah, they're not going to do that. I don't believe extraterrestrials land on earth and appear to people. I don't believe that solicitors who call you on the phone are really going to take just a moment of your time. <laughs> and I don't believe that road construction on I-35 will be uh, completed in my lifetime or that of my children. I'm just kind of skeptical by nature. And it's okay, smart even a lot of times, to be skeptical, to have doubts. Now, you'll notice that Jesus did not become angry with Thomas. He did not demand that he accept everything on blind faith. Instead, he said, hey, here, see for yourself the nail scars in my hands, the wounds in my side. Well, for the past month or so, we've been in a series called Entourage, talking about the 12 men that Jesus hand-selected to be his disciples, his inner circle. And so far, we've talked about Peter. We talked about Jude and James. Talked about a guy named Simon the Zealot, who was kind of a radical. Andrew and Philip. Last week was Judas. And today, it's Thomas and Bartholomew, also sometimes known as Nathaniel. Now, if you haven't been here for the whole series, it's okay. This is primarily an Easter talk, but just from the perspective of doubters and those who have questions. You know, I remember when my kids were little, and one night I was talking to Megan and, and Matthew, and I, I just thought I'd test them. I said, let's see together how many of the 12 disciples you can name. And they said, uh, Peter, yeah. They said, John, I said, yeah. They said, Judas, I said, yeah. So they couldn't get any others. I said, well, okay, one of them, his name starts with the letter T. And Megan goes, Tristan? No, there's no Tristan in the Bible. 
Thomas. Now, when people talk about Thomas, they always preface his name with what word? Doubting Thomas. Doubting. And that preface was meant more as a criticism than it was as a compliment, right? A criticism because he refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead without proof. But is that really a bad thing? That he refused to believe until he had some actual proof? Now, when you read the names of Jesus' apostles, some are pretty familiar, like James and John, Peter, Matthew, Thomas. Others are more obscure, like this guy, Bartholomew. He, like I said, sometimes he went by Nathaniel, like in this passage. The next day, it says, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth, he said, can anything good come from there? Now here he's called Nathanael, which is believed to have been his first name, and Bartholomew was believed to have been his family name, his last name. And the name Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy, who was the king of a land called Dersham at that time. Some Bible scholars believe he may have been the only one of the 12 disciples that actually had some royal blood. But the reason I'm lumping Bartholomew or Nathaniel in with Thomas is because of this passage is all we know about him. And notice his response at the bottom. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? It's like today we might go, Stillwater. <laughs> can anything good come from there? M M Nathaniel or Bartholomew, which he was skeptical. He was a doubter, sort of like Thomas. Well, here's the passage of Scripture where Thomas is most well known for. A few days after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. However, Thomas was not with them at the time. Well, later when the others came and told him about this with supercharged excitement, he's alive, he's back. He's like, what? No way. He's, I witnessed with my own eyes him being crucified. They insisted, uh, you know, that, that, that he was alive. Well, the next time he, he appeared to them, Thomas uh, was, was there, and yet at that point he remained, I, I kind of messed up there, he remained un, unconvinced at that time, and he said, I'd have to see with my own eyes, I'd have to touch the wound in his side before I'm ever going to believe any resurrection took place. Well, then later, later Jesus shows up, and Thomas was there at that time, and is Jesus angry with him? Does Jesus chew him out and say, man, I can't believe you wouldn't, you, you know, you, would, you wouldn't go along with it? No, he simply says, here, touch me. See for yourself so you can stop doubting and believe. And upon seeing it himself, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now, Thomas and others learned a, a lot about Jesus that day, and I'm hoping that many of us will learn that Jesus is not angry with or afraid of honest doubt. In fact, he openly invites any and all who have questions to come and seek and to ask and to touch. How different Jesus is from many religious leaders of his day and our day also who demand blind loyalty from their followers, who disqualify anyone who has the audacity to doubt. Jesus didn't do that. He's like, hey, check it out. Touch you know, see for yourself whether I'm for real or not. You know, like I said, some of us by nature are kind of skeptical. Others of us tend to be very trusting, just kind of the way we are. Sometimes even to the point of being too trusting. When it crosses over to being gullible or naive, that can become a liability, right? So, as you know, salespeople or telemarketers can take advantage of people who are a little too trusting. So having some measure of doubt or skepticism is actually a good thing. The word doubt literally means two minds. The doubting person vacillates between, you know, two points of view. He or she is uncertain. They hesitate to go one way or, or another until there's more evidence or whatever that makes them more sure of things. Sometimes we think of faith and doubt as opposites. But that's not really the case. Thomas, Thomas's doubts did not indicate a lack of faith, but rather the need or desire to validate his faith by facts, not just to go along because of wishful thinking or hearsay. 
Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, about 15 years ago, there was a, a news story on all, all over the, the, the state, but it eventually went all over the country, about a mobile home in Mangum, Oklahoma. And people had found out someone had in, had in the family had gone into the bathroom at night, stood on the stool for some reason, looked out the opaque window in the bathroom and could see a cross in the reflection, and they started telling people about it. And after a while, there was a long line of people going into this mobile home at night to, to get a glimpse of this cross that they thought they could see um, in the reflection. And hundreds and hundreds of people, this went on for days and days, and people were coming out talking to the, the news people going, it's a miracle. It changed my life. It's a sign from God. Now, I'm not trying to be cruel, but that's not the kind of proof or evidence that I want to base my faith on. Standing on the stool of a mobile home in Mangum, Oklahoma, looking at an opaque cross, you know. In the, I mean, eternity is at stake here, right? I've heard it said, I cannot believe, my heart cannot believe, my heart cannot accept what my mind rejects. And sometimes it's like say, hey, I might want to feel good about that or kind of got to go along with that a little bit, but nah, I, I, I just really can't. Check this out. Now, in, in check, Acts chapter 17, it says, now the Berean Jews, men, men, they were from the town called Berea. Uh, the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul, the apostle Paul, was telling them was true. And they were called more noble. Just because some TV preacher or Christian author says or writes something doesn't always mean it's true and accurate. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, you've got to throw it out, right? So doubt, being skeptical, can actually be a good, a good thing. However, there's a very important difference between being skeptical and being cynical, I think. A doubter or a skeptic has an, an honest quest for facts, for the truth. A cynic often questions not to honestly seek answers, but to mock, right? And these days, it's not uncommon at all to hear comedians or members of the media or other celebrities or so forth who are very negative, very critical about the Christian faith. And they take every opportunity to slam and belittle Christians, make fun of those who believe in God and the Bible. And of course, when they see something on TV like the miracle of the cross image in the mobile, you know, mobile home in rural Oklahoma, well, you know, that just further cements their views. However, I would challenge any and all cynics to actually study the facts and evidences for themselves. In other words, rather than just spout off what you once heard a college professor say, you know, ripping things that you really haven't done your due diligence on, that, that's, not really, that's not really acceptable. And over the years, I've actually challenged a few people along this line. And thus far, every, in every single case, not one of them had personally studied the evidences that support the Christian faith. They were simply parroting the arguments or questions they maybe heard other people say. And to me, that's not an honest doubter. That's a cynic who's basically closed-minded to the overwhelming mountain of historical evidence that, that formed the foundation of the Christian faith. So I would challenge them, seek for yourself. Seek honestly. Ask your toughest questions and then deal honestly with the answers. Read the books. Take the time. Do your due diligence. And then decide. When you hear people say, well, no educated person believes in the Bible anymore. It's filled with myths and contradictions. I feel like, really? Because those who have actually studied the evidences call it the single best documented piece of ancient, ancient literature in the world today. The Bible passes the test of historical credibility with flying colors. That's why it stood the test of time. I mean, while the cynics who have criticized it have died one by one. The Bible lives on. And Christianity, the Christian faith, lives on. I mean, why in 2,000 years has no one been able to finally and forever discredit the Bible and disprove Christianity once and for all? And yet there is this misperception out there that, you know, when you go to church, you sort of have to check your mind at the door, you know, 
Like, I'm going to leave my mind out there. And it's kind of like in the old days when you'd go into a nice restaurant and there was a closet there and they would take your coat and they'd put it in there on your way in. And on your way out, you'd pick it back up. That's the way some people see people have to do in church. I check my mind at the, at the door and I have to just go in and believe all this stuff without thinking about it. You know, that's why Christians are often seen as gullible and naive. They hear the preacher telling people, well, you got to believe it because I said so. Or science is the enemy of the Christian faith, those kinds of deals. To them, there's just this intellectual disconnect that seems required or expected when you go into church, and that's not the case. I think that's a viewed skew point, uh, a skewed viewpoint. God just about said something really bad there, I think. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, churches should uh, have signs that say, like, doubters welcome, questions welcome. Because here's a little secret that churches and sometimes Christians tried to hide from others, and that is that true believers have doubts now and then. I don't know if you've ever heard of Philip Yancey. He's written in this book called Disappointment with God. It tells of a letter he received from a woman who was struggling with her life and faith in God, and he says the young mother wrote that her joy had turned to bitterness and grief when she delivered a daughter with spinal bifida, which is a birth defect that leaves the spinal cord uh, exposed. And he said in page after page after page, she recounted how the medical bills had taken up all the family savings and how her marriage had cracked apart because her husband came to resent all the time that she had to spend with their sick child. And as her life crumbled around her, she began to find herself doubting whether God really was the faithful, loving God that he was supposed to be. And so she was writing in and saying, do you have any advice? You know, you don't have to be a skeptic or a cynic to sometimes have questions like, if God is so loving, why did he, why did he allow this to happen? Why did he allow that person to die or this wonderful person to get sick? You know, why do my prayers sometimes seem to go unanswered? You know, is Jesus really the only way to God? Those kinds of questions. Have you ever doubted God's something about God in your life? Have you ever doubted God's presence in your life? You know, you're going through something terrible and you're all alone and you're just like, God, you know, where are you? Have you ever asked God for forgiveness and then not really believed that you were forgiven? I would say that most all of us here have had doubts and questions, even as believers. So is that a lack of faith? Well, when you have times of doubt or uncertainty about God or spiritual things, I want to give you three suggestions. Number one, just acknowledge your doubts. It's okay. God is a big God. He can handle your fears, your doubts, your unanswerable questions. He won't be offended. He won't get angry. Jesus wasn't upset with Thomas, and God won't be upset with you. Number two, act on your faith, not on your doubts. Allow your faith to bubble up, and that would dictate your actions and not allowing your doubt to take over. You think about it, that's what, that's what Noah did when he built the ark. You don't think he had doubts along the way? And when Moses was supposed to walk out into the raging rivers, uh, uh, raging waters of the Red Sea to part him, you don't think he had some doubts? Or maybe when David was going up against Goliath, or when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, you don't think they had fears and doubts? You know, they did. They didn't know in advance that everything was going to turn out as it did. But they faced uncertainties, and they decided to trust God. They decided to act on their faith, not to be dominated into acting by their doubts. And we can do the same thing. And then third suggestion, doubt your doubts, not your faith. Doubt your doubts, not your faith. You know, almost all of us here have been through some really tough times in our lives, times we've just like, can't believe that this happened to us, you know, like going through a broken marriage or being diagnosed with cancer or someone that we love or going through serious financial problems. All of us have. All of us have had relational conflicts. Many of us have lost jobs. We've had family problems. We've had goals in life that we've fallen short of. But when you find yourself in that valley of uncertainty and fear and you're tempted to cave in to your worries and, the de and doubt, hang on, hang on to your faith. Just keep walking one day at a time you know one hour at a time 
even just one step at a time. Just keep walking forward because nothing is gained by camping out and staying in the valley of darkness. The only way out is to keep on walking. Years ago, I came across uh, this quote, question the validity of every negative thought that comes into your mind. Question the validity of every negative thought. that Now, sometimes they are valid, but a lot of times we're plagued by negative thoughts. that They're not valid at all. They're not real. They don't make sense. But somehow they come and they begin to even engulf our lives. So doubt your doubts. Don't doubt your faith. So when uncertainties arise, go back to what you do know to be true. Now, I have something I have on my desk that I read every day, and I update it occasionally. It's called a daily reflection. And one of the things I have on there is a handful of things that I believe and know to be absolutely true. Certainty. So in a life of uncertainties, I need to be reminded every day there, there are certain things that are for sure. God is good. The Bible is true. Jesus is the way to heaven. Life is short. Eternity is longer. People matter more than, th than things do. God works all things for my good. God is sovereign. My life is in his hands. And those certainties help me deal with my uncertainties. When you have some certainties you can hang on to, that helps you to get to see things in light of that rather than always seeing through the lens of uncertainty. Well, last, I want to address a doubt that far too many people struggle with these days, and that is, how can I really know 100% for sure that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Think about it like this. If you've ever done much flying, maybe you have had this experience or at least witnessed that sometimes there is a two distinct categories of people at check-in time around the gate areas of airport. First, there are those who are already checked in. They got their boarding passes, and they're usually sitting off, drinking coffee, maybe looking at stuff on their phone, uh, sleeping, drooling, whatever. They're, they don't have a worry in the world because everything is set. Then there's another group of people who are co very conspicuous at the gate, uh, the gate area. These are standby passengers, and they're not sitting around reading. They're not on their phone. You can spot them because they are pacing nervously back and forth in front of the counter. If you've ever had this experience, you know what I'm talking about. They're on a first-name basis with the ticket agent, trying to talk him or her into getting them on their flight. And they're not happy campers until their name is called and they're assigned a seat and they receive their boarding pass, at which time their entire demeanor changes. It's like a makeover right there in the, in the gate. Their body lang language changes. They relax. They hug and kiss the ticket agent. And then they go sit down and sleep and drool until the plane, plane takes off. But all that change is brought about because now they know. Now they know they're going to be on the flight. And there's a sense of certainty, there's a sense of, a sense of relief that they're not going to be left behind at the gate. There's a huge difference between hoping something is true and knowing something is true. I bet all, most all of us here at some time in our lives have been outside a surgical ward while a loved one is in there being operated on. You ever had that experience and you're waiting and waiting and you're pacing back and forth and you're texting for prayers and you're, you're, you're calling and you're, you're just hoping, praying, and then the surgeon, the door opens up and the surgeon comes out and they do like this. And then now everything's okay, right? It's all different because you know everything's going to be all right. How much more important is it for us to have certainty about heaven? about eternity. The Bible says, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know, you may have confidence that you have eternal life. This verse and many others like it inform us that it is possible to have confidence about our destination in the afterlife. However, this is not a confidence in yourself. Rather, it is a confidence in in what Jesus did for you on the cross. You know, it's really sad, but the majority of people today in our world still believe that to get to heaven, you can do it by, you, if you're a good person, you go to heaven. If you believe there's a God, you go to heaven. 
If at the end of your life your stack of good deeds is taller than your stack of bad deeds, you go to heaven. According to the Bible, none of those answers are correct. Instead, it is simply acknowledging, I am a sinner. I have said, thought, and done many things that violate God's laws. Therefore, I'm going to put my hope for heaven into what Jesus did for me on the cross. Not that I'm a good enough person or I deserve to go to heaven. And that upon my death someday, my only hope, my only ticket in, is that Jesus died on the cross for my sins to forgive me of all of my sins and to grant me eternal life. When I show up one day on the other side, judgment day, that's it. I wasn't a good enough person. It wasn't because I just believed in God or did enough more good things than I did bad things. It is only Jesus' death on the cross that purchased my ticket in someday. So you don't have to be like one of those standby passengers, you know, anxious, uncertain, hoping but doubting about your eternal destination. You can have confidence. And that really is what Easter is all about. Why don't we stand? We'll have our closing prayer. Lord, today we're grateful for the opportunity to come in and celebrate what many of us believe to be the greatest event that's ever happened. And it shook uh, life on earth and it has transformed and changed uh, our lives and even more importantly, our eternal destiny. And Lord, for those here who have still have doubts and questions, I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to, to do their due diligence and to find out to the point where they, they can feel confident about whatever decision they make. And they'll be making it based on, on facts and truth and not just feelings or misinformation. Lord, it's, it's great to be here with our church family and friends, and we pray, God, as we leave this place, that we will be uh, your representatives, your ambassadors out into the world, that people might see some of you in how we live, and that we would represent you well, and that we would be a light in our dark world. So, Lord, we're grateful for this time and uh, time together, many people with family today, and uh, we just thank you for all of the many blessings in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, thanks for coming, and we will see you next week probably.